Gentlemen, this is no humbug. Baby Travis Long is only three months old, but he's on his way to a major operation. Without it, he would die, because he was born with a malformed heart with the blood vessels wrongly connected. Five years ago, this type of operation had never been attempted. It was developed here in the Boston Children's Hospital, and surgeon Richard Jonas now faces a heavy responsibility. His decisions over the next few hours will literally mean life or death for his tiny patient. Modern surgery is a team effort. An operation like this calls for many specialist skills. The anaesthetists are experts in handling babies. There's a staff of technicians to look after all the equipment, like the heart-lung machine that will take over while the baby's heart is stopped. And specialist nurses are responsible for preventing any risk of infection. But one member of the team is somehow special, the inheritor of a heroic tradition. The surgeon who first cut open the heart of a tiny baby took great risks, he had to and he built on the work of a long line of other surgeons who also took risks, often in defiance of conventional wisdom. They needed great courage, and so did their patients, because it was only through failure that they learned to succeed. The image of the surgeon now is of a man who exercises an impressive skill with every hope of success. 150 years ago, when this theatre was in use in the 1830s, a very different surgeon worked in a very different setting. You, come down here and be a patient. Poor fellow, lie up there. Porters would leave us, and then we need, in a non-teaching hospital, two really strong, hefty men to hold the patient down at the first touch of the knife on the flesh. Uh, you and you. Excellent chaps. And the job of the students, or the porters, of course, was to keep the patient. They were the anaesthetists of those days. Now, we've got chairs there in front of you for important visitors who wanted to see the show. That's why, of course, theatres are still in this country called theatres to this day, although in the USA they're called operating rooms. Floor would be covered with sawdust to sop up the blood and sometimes the vomit and there'd be a box here full of sawdust which would be pushed by the surgeon under the part that was bleeding to catch the blood the surgeon would come in through this door here take off his jacket hang it on the hook and pick up his favorite operating frock coat frock coat stained with the blood and pus and secretions of a hundred operations. In fact, the more senior the surgeon, the filthier the frock coat. Now, as I said, time is going to be of the essence in those pre-anesthetic days. Every second was going to be minutes, every minute, hours. Patients would go to the surgeon who had the reputation of being the quickest. And of course, surgeons had to have nerves of steel because they would be operating against the clock with a screaming, struggling patient. Many young men aiming to be surgeons gave up medicine. They just couldn't face the horrors of this room. Yet, surgery had already come a long way. 
The predecessor of that surgeon was a very rough character indeed. Surgery was a craft which the apprentice picked up from watching his master. He was often also the local barber, another craft needing well-sharpened instruments. The surgeon had very little in common with the much more highly educated physician and was not allowed to call himself doctor. British surgeons today still use the title mister. The name surgeon is derived from the Greek for hands. No one expected these surgeons to use their brains. There was medicine as practiced by the clerics who were specifically banned from actually getting blood on their fingers. So this meant that the surgeon was a humble man, a craftsman, called in to work in the direction of the doctor or the physician, because the physicians couldn't actually operate themselves. The range of operations performed by these manual workers was limited mainly to repairing the ravages of battle. And it was with the military surgeons that the road to respectability began. It was only on the battlefield where the injury had carried out, uh, as it were, an entry to the body, which the surgeons themselves were frightened to make. They were forced to follow on and, and try and sort things out and repair things. And this actually, as it were, the injury and the severity of the injury was forcing the surgeons to go where they wouldn't normally dare to go in peacetime. One thing that experience of the battlefield taught the surgeons was that even minor wounds were extremely dangerous. The main problem with certainly wounds of the limbs in wartime is the fact that without surgery they inevitably become infected, partly because of this massive contamination with dirt and bacteria which goes in at the time of the injury. The only way that the ancient surgeons perhaps could get way, way of this was by amputating and therefore cutting away the whole part that was concerned. And amputation was only the beginning of suffering. Surgeons believed the correct way to finish the operation was to dip the stump in boiling oil, while the raw flesh of gunshot wounds would be cauterized with red-hot irons. In the mid-17th century, when Ambroise Paré became a military surgeon, he was taught this as the one safe procedure. It was only, in fact, Paré who initially discovered by accident, because of the one day when he was a young military surgeon, he ran out of oil and he could think of nothing else to do but instead of putting boiling oil on to put on a bland mixture of egg yolks and various other things like that and he describes how he spent all night after this uh, wondering how on earth his patients were going to survive because he had done which was quite the non-standard treatment and he was terrified that when he woke in the morning he would find them all dead or in a terrible state and of course when he got to their tent in the morning they were all far better than they would normally have been and he, from this, deduced that perhaps burning oil, boiling oil, was not the best thing to do. Paré became known throughout France as an outstanding and humane surgeon. And his influence reduced some of the calling's worst brutalities. By the 1830s, the surgeon had gained in respectability. But surgery remained a crude and cruel business. Now, let's pretend, it's only going to pretend, that we're going to amputate this young man's leg. Now, what we'll need is uh, one of the assistants will hold the leg up for me like that, you see. The other assistant, who won't put it on because it would be painful, he'd put the tourniquet around the thigh, or alternatively, sometimes just press onto the femoral artery at the groin, at the pressure point. The two of the strongest medical students we find would hold the patient down, if you don't mind. And uh, we're ready. I'd get my, my sawdust ready under the leg. House surgeon would give me a knife. Two quick sweeps, front and back, would turn back the skin flaps, which I'd turn back with my fingers. Drop the knife on the floor. Amputation knife. Wrong knife. The amputation knife would be slid along the bone, at the, uh, parallel with the bone. Turn the blade up, up through the muscles of the thigh. Through back, back behind the femur turn down through the muscles of the back of the femur. Drop the knife on the floor. Saw! Few sweeps of the saw, turning back the muscles in my hand, leg amputated, thrown into the sawdust. 
the screams would turn into sobs, call the porters, take the patient back to the, to the ward. 30 seconds would be about par for amputating at mid-thigh. Thank you very much. Didn't hurt you. Oh, excellent. <laughs> But in 1830, the unfortunate patient, even if he survived the surgery, might well succumb to infection or bleed to death. Well, horrible that, though that scene was, primitive, painful, gruesome, it was the best that scientific surgery had to offer 150 years ago in one of the premier teaching hospitals in Europe. Few patients would submit to the agony of the knife. So the surgeon's repertoire was limited. His most heroic operation at that time was the awful cutting for stones in the bladder. It's interesting that bladder stones were very, very common at that time. They're not nearly as common now, thank fortune. They were terribly painful. And after a man had gone through this awful pain, it was commoner in men than in women, uh, for many years, finally he was willing to submit to this terrible, dreadful operation of cutting for stone, which was done without anesthesia, had a high mortality. But sometimes it was successful and the patient could go back to his, his regular life again. For surgery to advance beyond a brutal craft, three main barriers had to be overcome. The control of blood loss, the curse of surgical infection, and above all, the conquest of pain. They used alcohol, of course. People often got pretty drunk <laughs> before operations. They gave a lot of, of morphia and laudanum and other uh, heavy drugs of that type. And we have reason to believe from, from pictures a little earlier than that in the 16th century that actually they would have a, a boxer or a rather tough fellow off the street with a boxing glove on who would try to knock out uh, people before operation seems incredible, but evidently that was done. So they did do things, but but many people, uh, as the military surgeon said, they'd give the soldier a bullet and tell him to bite that bullet, and then they would amputate the leg in very fast time. And it, it just seems incredible suffering, and yet many lives were saved, and it's quite surprising the operations they did. In 1809, in the living room of this house in Danville, Kentucky, the surgeon Ephraim McDowell performed one of those exceptional feats of surgery. His patient, Mrs. Susan Crawford, was suffering from a gigantic tumor of the ovary. A truly heroic lady, she traveled 60 miles on horseback to get here. As McDowell prepared to operate, an angry crowd gathered outside, threatening to shoot him if his patient died. I made an incision nine inches in length into the cavity of the abdomen. We cut open the tumor and took out 15 pounds of dirty gelatinous substance, after which we extracted the sac, which weighed seven pounds and one half. The operation lasted 25 minutes with no anesthetic. Mrs. Crawford lived to the age of 78, so her suffering was rewarded. Yet she could have been saved so much agony if her surgeon had known of research done nine years before on the gas nitrous oxide. The work was done by the chemist Humphrey Davy, and when he came to publish his results, he described the pain-killing effect of breathing the gas and suggested its use in surgery. Unfortunately, the book's obscure title meant that it went unnoticed by most surgeons. Davy called his preparation laughing gas and cartoonists had plenty of ideas for its use. Nitrous oxide was only one of several vapors which people inhaled for fun. Another was ether. Demonstrations of their effects became part of the music hall. It was a young dentist called Morton who forced the surgeons to take notice. He'd been to a show and seen the effects of ether. He realized that those who breathed the vapor were not only intoxicated, but were also unable to feel pain. Morton took his discovery to Massachusetts General Hospital, where it was tried out during an operation by one of the most influential surgeons in America, Professor John Warren. 
distinguished man in his time, now famous for doing a minor operation. Because the operation that was done was on a young boy called Gilbert Abbott, a young lad of about 17 or 18, who had a little simple cyst in his neck. The room was packed. It was a room like this with, with students and surgeons who heard some miraculous thing was going to take place. Morton gave the anesthetic to Abbott using the most primitive apparatus, a simple glass sphere with a sponge in it soaked in ether. Abbott sucked at the ether. Within a few minutes, Morton said, your patient is ready. Students held the patient as hard as they could because they knew he was going to struggle and fight. Warren picked up his knife, dissected out the cyst. Nothing happened, not a murmur. Was he alive or dead? Within a minute or two, he stirred and sat up. The crowds went wild. Warren turned to them and said, Gentlemen, this is no humbug. Modern anesthesia brings out the poet in the surgeon, you see. October the 16th, 1846. One of the great dates in the history of medicine. Before it, the screams, the cries, the moans of the operating theater. After it, the peace and quiet of modern surgery. A commemorative photograph was taken, but not until two days later when the group reassembled for the purpose. They had, after all, made history. Warren immediately went on to use anesthesia in major operations, and the surgical hierarchy was converted. Within two months, a report appeared in The Lancet, published in London. It came to the attention of Robert Liston, senior surgeon at University College Hospital. Magnificent man, six foot two, tremendously strong. It was said that he could hold the leg with one hand, compressing the femoral artery, and amputate with the other hand. Like that. He was so strong. Quite fastest time, 28 seconds, in which he removed not only the patient's leg, but also two of the assistant's fingers and the patient's left testicle, all with the same sweep of the knife. The patient today, Frederick Churchill, also needed a leg amputated. Liston came in, and turning to the audience, said, Gentlemen, in this room you've seen me try and assuage the agonies of the knife, he said. You've seen me use hypnotism and mesmerism. You've seen me use alcohol and laudanum. But today, we're going to try a Yankee dodge to render men insensible, he said. Time me, gentlemen, he said. All the watches came out. They held up the leg, put on the tourniquet, amputated the leg. 28 seconds, one of the students called out. The leg was off. Bandage was put on. Was he alive or dead? Absolute silence in the operating theatre. Churchill stirred. Take me back to the ward, he said. I can't go through with it. Let me die as I am. Liston held up the bandaged stump like that. Churchill burst into tears. Porters carried him away. The crowds went mad. Liston said, gentlemen, this Yankee dodge beats mesmerism hollow. I tell you, it brings out the poet. <laughs> Liston's anaesthetic machine, like Morton's, used ether. But ether, though effective, was unpleasant for the patients to breathe. So a search began for a substitute. James Young Simpson, a fashionable Edinburgh obstetrician, liked to try out new chemical substances with a group of medical friends after dinner. On one occasion, their experience was dramatic. On awakening, Dr. Simpson's first perception was mental. This is far stronger and better than ether, said he to himself. His second was to note that among the friends about him, there was both confusion and alarm. Hearing a noise, he turned round and saw Dr. Duncan beneath a chair, quite unconscious and snoring in a most determined manner. This was chloroform, and Simpson extolled its virtues. Most of those who know the sensations produced by ether inhalation and who have subsequently breathed the chloroform have strongly declared the inhalation and influence of chloroform to be far more pleasant than those of ether. <laughs>
The first time Simpson used chloroform, his patient gave birth to a girl. The grateful mother christened the poor child anesthesia. For a while, it seemed that chloroform would take over from ether. But within a year of its introduction, the girl of 11 died in the dental chair from being given chloroform for the extraction of teeth. And that was the first shadow. And then more deaths were sudden, unexpected deaths in perfectly fit people very early on in the inhalation, unknown in ether. They might de die later but uh, not so early on, and this became a frightening thing. Attempts were made to solve the problems with more sophisticated apparatus, but the chloroform deaths continued, so most anaesthetists returned to ether. It would remain the leading anaesthetic for a century, despite its unpleasant effects. <coughs> Apart from a few diehards who argued that pain helped the healing process, surgeons were quick to adopt anaesthesia. They were slower to realise that it not only relieved pain, it also gave them more time. There have been generations, you know, surgeons have been told to act quickly and to work quickly, do an amputation in almost seconds. So it took them a very long time indeed to, to uh, adjust to this new potential. James Syme of Edinburgh was one of the first to exploit the extra time that anaesthesia gave. Syme pointed out that when bone was diseased, as in his elbow joint, it was no longer necessary to amputate the whole limb quickly. There was now enough time to pare away only the diseased portion of the bone and reconstruct the joint, leaving a useful limb. But pain-free surgery exposed the second major barrier to surgical advance. Anaesthesia made surgery possible, you might say, major surgery, but it still wasn't safe. And reading the case records of those times is absolutely dreadful. They would do the simplest little operation and be followed by gangrene and terrible streptococcus infection. Of course, they didn't know anything about microbiology. Several historians of, of surgery describe the period between the discovery of ether and the work of Lister, which we'll call 1870, as the black period of surgery because operations were done that shouldn't have been done and the results were terrible. The chemist Pasteur signaled the way out of surgery's black period. He discovered bacteria and showed that they were involved in spreading disease. Pasteur's work was described to Joseph Lister, professor of surgery in Glasgow, and he determined to find a way of poisoning these bacteria which it seemed were killing his patients. Well, the professor of chemistry in Glasgow was a friend of his, and the professor of chemistry in Glasgow said to Lister, there's a marvellous new process they're using in the sewage works in Carlisle. They're putting carbolic into the sewage, and it cuts down the smell. Now, Lister knew very well that the smell of a sewage works was extremely similar to the smell of the operating theatre and the surgical ward. So he got some carbolic, and he decided to kill the microbes using carbolic acid. And the crucial experiment was in August 1865. A child, James Greenlees, had broken his leg. Lister should have amputated, because this was a compound fracture, the bone had broken through the skin, and a lethal infection was bound to follow. But he didn't amputate. What Lister did was to apply phenol, which is a, a mild antiseptic in the concentrations he used, directly to the protruding bone and to the tissues around it. And he cut away the tissues that had been damaged, and then he just immobilized it and let the patient's own local inflammation begin to overcome it. Of Lister's first 12 patients treated with carbolic or phenol, 10 survived with limbs intact limbs he would before have amputated without hesitation. In Lister's operating theatre, antiseptic technique was carried further. Believing that airborne bacteria were a major source of infection, he performed all his operations in a damp mist of carbolic, produced by a spray pump. 
The system was extremely unpleasant and difficult to use, but Lister's staff suffered in silence. Though one irreverent person was heard to intone, let us spray at the beginning of an operation. But despite its success in Lister's hands, the carbolic regime was not quick to catch on. Surgeons elsewhere were unconvinced of the need for this troublesome procedure. <coughs> America was very slow. There was a conservative faction in surgery that said we shouldn't change. And in a way, medicine, science, uh, fields of learning always have the conservatives saying let's not change our thinking and the radicals saying let's change. There's always a tension there. It's a healthy tension. And in this country, we were slow, but finally, of course, we did. One of the first American surgeons to take up Lister's ideas was William Halstead of Baltimore, a man who would dominate American surgery for three decades. <coughs> Halstead had studied in Europe, where he'd been converted to the virtues of antisepsis. But at the moment, the antiseptic regime was presenting him with a personal problem. His theater nurse, Miss Caroline Hampton, was allergic to the carbolic. The rash on her hands became so severe that she threatened to desert her post. Halstead had seen excellent results from following Lister's techniques and he was loath to abandon them. On the other hand, he was most upset at the prospect of losing Miss Hampton's services. So he contacted the Goodyear Rubber Company and asked them to make her some rubber gloves. reason for Halstead's extraordinary solicitude became apparent the following year, when he and Miss Hampton were married. <coughs> Miss Hampton's gloves were to protect her hands from the antiseptic. Later, gloves would be universally adopted to protect the patients from the surgeon's hands, which Robert Koch, the German bacteriologist, had incriminated as a prime source of wound infection. Koch had invented techniques for studying and identifying different species of bacteria. With cotton swabs, he took samples of the bacteria living on the hands and fingernails of the surgeons and grew them in test tubes alongside blood from infected wounds. On examination, he found that many of the cultures were identical. He proved that some of these bacteria were harmless, but that others led to fever and death. The harmful organisms had to be prevented from ever reaching the patient's wound. And Koch experimented with ways of killing them, wherever they were found. He showed that boiling was far more effective than Lister's carbolic acid. From now on, the problem of infection would be handled differently, not by antisepsis, but by asepsis. Antisepsis means the infection is there, you're going to do something, you're going to kill it with this phenol or whatever you were using. But asepsis means setting up a completely sterile field. And the typical Hollywood pictures we see so often of all the masks and gowns and all the white things in an operating room, which is perfectly true, that is the setting up of a sterile field, which is called asepsis or aseptic technique. But it was very gradually, with disputes about what was and was not necessary, that the surgeons began to change their ways. In the mid-1870s, operations were often performed on the ward. From now onwards in hospital, they would use designated rooms. Special theater clothes became standard, and this time they were cleaner than normal clothing. At first, some surgeons worked in large amphitheaters with an audience in everyday clothes. This increased the risk of infection, but it was argued that students must be able to watch the new operations being developed at centers like Vienna 
where Theodore Billroth was advancing surgery of the abdomen. The amphitheatres disappeared when the audiences became smaller. Some said because surgery lost its excitement. The patients now tended to survive. In William Halsted's theatre, where rubber gloves were first worn by Miss Hampton, surgeons now adopted them as an aseptic precaution. At first, Halsted himself only covered two fingers and thumb, because like many surgeons, he was worried that the gloves would make him clumsy. But he soon adopted the full gloves, as he developed new operations where the wounds were very large, too risky without good control of infection. And his team wore hats, as it was observed how fertile a source of bacteria hair could be. And finally, masks were adopted, at first by the surgeons only, later by everyone in the theatre. Changes in the surgical environment called for the backup of a new technology. Systems were developed for sterilising everything that might contact the patient's wound during an operation. The best method was usually the steam autoclave, which left everything dry and ready to use. But instruments could also be sterilised by soaking in a bath of the stronger chemicals now available, or even in a gas oven with tablets to produce bactericidal fumes. Now, a great era of expansion began. Surgeons no longer had qualms about opening the abdomen, and heroic operations, which had been rare, became widespread. Sometimes they were successful, but sometimes they encountered a problem that at first was as mysterious as infection had been. Surgery had come up against the third barrier. They called it shock. The term shock is interesting. The picture was recognized during the Civil War. Stonewall Jackson was wounded in the shoulder when he was out in front of his troops at the Battle of Chancellorsville, and Stuart McGuire, a surgeon from Richmond, wrote an, an account of how Jackson looked as he was brought back, and it's a classic description of shock. He was pale, he was hungry for air, he was gasping, his blood pressure, they didn't measure blood pressure, but his circulation was very poor. It took a long time for people to appreciate that what we call shock today in trauma really just represents the effect of losing a lot of blood. Many people considered shock, as we think of it, as a sort of psychiatric syndrome, a sort of psychological response to injury, and it took people a long time to realise it was just due to the fact that your lifeblood is on the floor. Patients went into shock when their blood volume dropped below a critical point. But surgeons, particularly those working in the abdomen, were often unsure just how much blood was being lost. And when shock did occur, they had no way of replacing it. Transfusions from animals to man had happened as far back as 1667. The lamb was usually the chosen animal, because it was thought that some of the character of the donor passed to the recipient. According to Samuel Pepys, this did occasion many pretty wishes, as of the blood of a Quaker to be let into an archbishop. But when a French doctor was sued after the death of a patient who had received such a transfusion, the idea was abandoned. And it wasn't until 1818 that a doctor in this very hospital at Guy's, a Blundell, carried out the first human blood, a human donor blood transfusion. Some were successful, many were disastrous because of course they didn't know anything at all about blood groups and so very often the blood was incompatible. At first the fact that some of the human transfusions were outstandingly successful whilst others were totally disastrous caused considerable confusion. But in 1900 Karl Lunchsteiner explained the contradictions he recognised that there were a number of different human blood groups and that the red cells from one group would be damaged by contact with the serum of another. Because this damage made the cells clump together, samples of blood could be tested for compatibility. To find out a person's blood group, sera of groups A and B are used. To carry out the test, a drop of diluted blood of unknown group is mixed first with group A serum 
and then another drop mixed with group B serum. The reaction can soon be read by the naked eye. If agglutination takes place, the red cells will be seen to form irregular clumps in the clear serum as seen on the left side. The first transfusions of matched blood were very crude. Because blood clotted in air, donor and patient were joined together by a tube. At first, no one had any idea of how much blood had passed across. By using a syringe, they were able to draw a known amount and inject it immediately. Now they knew how much they were transfusing, but it was hardly a practical arrangement. The difficulties remained unresolved until the First World War. Now, large numbers of the wounded were desperately in need of blood. For the first time in this war, use was made of an anti-clotting chemical, sodium citrate. Using this, blood could be drawn from the donor and kept for transfusion sometime later. The awkward direct methods were no longer necessary. Giving blood began as a patriotic duty, and many people enrolled as donors through the Red Cross. At such a time, it was never considered that blood donors might need to be paid. And in peacetime, the tradition continued that the healthy gave blood freely for the sick. So now the three barriers of pain, infection and blood loss, which had hindered the progress of surgery, could be overcome, at least by the most expert. The very skillful surgeon could now expect good results. To refine their skills, surgeons began to specialize. The American, Harvey Cushing, chose to work on the most delicate of organs, the brain, despite the fact that when he began, up to 70% of patients would die on the table. Cushing had studied with brain surgeons in Europe and had learnt there to control bleeding with massive arrays of artery clamps and to use a toothed wire to saw through the skull. Even though blood transfusions were now technically possible, Cushing took great care to prevent excessive bleeding. He was the first neurosurgeon to use diathermy, sealing the cut ends of blood vessels with an electric current and he made regular checks of his patient's blood pressure. In Cushing's hands, the outcome of brain surgery was transformed. Cushing's technique in operating on the brain, I would think, has probably rarely been equaled. I'm not a neurosurgeon myself, but we had many expert neurosurgeons in our department, and I would say they all respected his abilities tremendously. Cushing's outstanding qualities were also recognized in his own lifetime. So much so that two of his colleagues filmed a record of his 2000th operation. It was to remove a tumor of the pituitary gland deep in the middle of the brain, an amazing undertaking with the facilities available at that time. The result of any accidental infection in the brain would be catastrophic. So the observance of aseptic techniques in Cushing's theater was legendary. Despite the masks, he felt that any talking increased the risk of infection. So his operations were often performed in complete silence. The operations often lasted many hours. As the after effects of deep ether anesthesia over such a long period could be severe, Cushing worked with a local anesthetic with just enough ether to keep the patient unaware of what was going on. For a large part of his career, Cushing performed just one type of operation, the removal of brain tumors. By practice, he brought his own technique close to perfection. By the end of his career, 
Cushing had reduced the death rate following brain tumour surgery from 70% to a mere 4%. But Cushing was exceptional, the super specialist, performing just one type of operation. And he was working in a top surgical centre with excellent backup facilities. Most surgery was nothing like as sophisticated and nothing like as safe. World War II was the catalyst that was to transform the practice of ordinary surgery in the ordinary hospitals of Europe and America. There were large numbers of wounded. In these conditions, it was certain that many of their wounds would become infected. And this acted as a powerful spur to the development of the first effective drug to kill bacteria inside the body, penicillin. From now on, the danger of post-operative infection would lose some of its menace. Once again, there was an urgent need for blood for transfusion, and the service was rapidly expanded. Large numbers of new donors were enrolled and centres were set up to test and store the blood. It was now known it could safely be kept for some weeks before transfusion. After the war, this system would continue in place to supply as much blood as the surgeons needed. The first time they would enjoy such a luxury. The war also produced a crash program to train anaesthetists. Large numbers were needed to staff the emergency hospitals caring for the wounded. Many of the young men and women who had spent the war administering anaesthetics decided to specialize when they returned to civilian life. They replaced the general practitioner who had often been the only person available before the war. With their arrival, the whole basis of anaesthesia changed, as drugs like ether came under attack. In my early days, in the 30s, all our anaesthesia was basically done with ether, which is practically abandoned now. And we often used open cone ether. You take a cone, you know, drip the ether out of truly primitive in present day uh, thinking. But the patient had to be under very deep ether anesthesia. And of course, they had so much ether that their bodies, tissues were all saturated with ether. And they would sleep for hours and hours and hours, if not days. The new specialists who were now taking over anesthesia asked themselves why they were saturating their patients with ether. It was not to control pain. That took very little of the drug. But to make the muscles relax. Without such relaxation, the surgeons had difficulty operating, particularly in the abdomen. But the cost to the patient of these massive doses of ether was heavy. Ether is a pretty irritant drug to the lungs, but more important than that, the recovery is slow. And if you've had an abdominal operation, which inhibits your breathing anyway because of your wound, and you've got breathing depressed by your ether with secretions which ether causes in the lungs and you can't properly cough them up, you tend to get pneumonia. And one did see deaths from pneumonia following ether anesthesia. A much more specific method of relaxing the muscles was lurking in the Amazon jungle. The blowpipes, which the hunters used to kill monkeys high in the treetops, fired arrows tipped with poison. And the poison worked by paralyzing the muscles of the monkeys, precisely what the anaesthetists wanted to do to their patients. The active ingredient of the poison was the bark of a vine, and this was used by drug companies to make curare, which from the end of the 1940s became a standard part of the anaesthetic whenever muscle relaxation was needed, as in this caesarean operation. With muscles paralyzed, the patient could not breathe for herself, but by now the anaesthetist could do it for her. 
It was typical of the new scientific approach to anaesthesia. With curare to produce relaxation, only very light anaesthesia was needed. None of the curare got through to the baby, and the surgeon could work easily without worrying about the damaging effects of the anaesthetic drugs. The whole procedure could be completed in a fraction of the time, with almost immediate recovery. If a mere 15 minutes after a major operation, the patient could be wide awake and smiling, then surgery's horizons might be limitless. 150 years ago in this room, patients would only lie on this table in desperation. When they were so tortured and in such agony from their gangrenous leg or their stone in the bladder that they'd submit to the surgeon's knife. And often then they'd lose their nerve and, and, and say, I can't go through with it. And, and leave, like poor Frederick Churchill did after his leg was amputated. And now with modern anesthesia, with antisepsis, with blood transfusion, with antibiotics, the modern miracles of surgery, nothing can escape. Everything from the brain to bunions is available to, for the surgeon's healing knife. Yet the achievement surgery had made by the end of the war would be eclipsed by what was to come. Surgery was about to enter its golden age, an age in which the surgeons would penetrate hitherto forbidden territory, like the heart, and begin a revolution which would culminate in operations like this. Five hours have passed, and baby Travis now has a properly constructed heart properly connected to his vital blood vessel. A surgical team with skill and courage has taken a baby facing certain death and given him a normal life. warfare against the Red Cross flag has hitherto outgeneraled even the greatest commanders suffers a setback thanks to the new medical drug penicillin. Penicillin was unveiled to the British public with understandable excitement. The story of its discovery seemed so strange and marvelous that it immediately became part of our national folklore. This cement stride forward is due to a despised mold like the common growth on cheese. Here at St. Mary's Hospital Medical School in Paddington, through this very window 25 years ago, a speck of mould blew in and settled onto Professor Fleming's culture plate. The mould blowing in through the window is an attractive story. What really happened is even more bizarre. Romantic myths abound, but perhaps the greatest surrounds the discoverer himself. But if it had been left to Fleming, there would have been no drug today. Those who did the crucial work remain forgotten. It was Fleming who enjoyed the adulation of a grateful world. With incredible foresight, Fleming kept his original culture plate and it's now a national treasure stored at the British Library. Unfortunately it has badly decomposed but a replica shows what caught Fleming's attention in 1928. In between a big blob of green mold and yellow clumps of